Thanks for joining us for our second episode of Creative Direction. We are so excited to be here um, and to continue on this really powerful series. I'm your host this morning. My name is Valerie Thompson. I am the chair of the Mosaic Initiative of the American Advertising Federation, the Tlil chapter. Can everyone hear me okay? I wanna start with that because my laptop is a little wonky. Okay. Um, so I would like to tell you just a bit about uh, Mosaic really quickly. Our mission is to simply ensure that diversity is created and celebrated in our local art and advertising community. So feel free to check out more about us at aaftoledo.org forward slash mosaic. Today, we have an amazing opportunity to share with our special guest, Lewis Williams of Bureau Communications. And moderating this discussion is the lovely Candace Harrison. I will let her introduce herself and Lewis in just a moment. Just a few housekeeping items. Like everyone says on every Zoom call, we'd like everyone to mute themselves so that we can be able to hear the presenters. Um, so if you could do that now, that would be awesome. At the end, we will give you an opportunity to interact. We have a Q&A session. Um, so we ask that if you do have a question, please wait until the Q&A portion to ask it. You can at that time unmute yourself and ask, or you can put it in the chat. I am listed um, as the host, Valerie Thompson host in the chat list. So if you'd like to send me the question directly or if you'd like to post it, please make sure to do it at that time at the end. Um, and we'll also be sending out a follow up email after this call uh, that includes a link to the recording of the session, a link to our jam and playlist this morning. I hope some of you got to hear some of the awesome selections for that good pick me up for the morning and a survey about the webinar and details about upcoming events that we have going on. So be on the lookout for that after the event. And with that, I'm gonna hand it over to our moderator, Candace Harrison. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. And um, I'm really excited about today. As Valerie said, I'm Candace Harrison. Um, and my day job is I'm external communications manager for the Toledo Public School District. And also um, on the side, I am president and owner of Synergy Engagement. And I am excited, excited, excited today because we have Lewis Williams of Burrell Communications Group. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce him. And then right before um, we get into his talk, um, I'm gonna show you a little bit of his work. So you can see why I'm so excited to have him here today and just have him take some time out of what I know has to be an incredibly busy life, just given all that he's into. <laughs> so Lewis Burrell is the chief creative officer, Lewis Burrell, I'm sorry, Lewis Williams is the chief creative officer for Burrell Communications Group. Recognized as one of Ad Week's 2018 Top Creative 100, Lewis is a passionate creative leader and storyteller with extensive experience in total and multicultural marketing. During his career, he has created award-winning work for iconic brands such as Google, Coca-Cola, McDonald's, Walmart, Toyota, American Airlines, Budweiser, Hallmark, Walt Disney World, and Allstate. His creative has garnered him awards from The One Show, Communication Arts, The Addies, New York festivals and Effie's. After spending much of his successful career at Leo Burnett Chicago, he is presently the chief creative officer for Burrell Communications. He leads a talented staff of creatives, producers, broadcast business and digital artists. He leads by example and inspires with passion. He is a distinguished alumnus of the Kent State School of Design here in Ohio. And I was happy to hear that, where he established the Lewis and Donna Williams Scholarship Fund. Those funds are dedicated to students who need financial assistance. In order to maintain a healthy work-life balance, he is an avid runner and a dedicated yoga student. Welcome, everyone, here in Toledo to Mr. Lewis Williams. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Candice, how you doing? Good, 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 good. Um, and I heard, hope you'll get to, um, when we send it out, I hope that um, we set a tone with the playlist that we shared for you today. <laughs> you know, you know, I was, it took me back. I was listening to Roy Ayers there, man. I'm like, ah, oh, it took me back to my Kent State days, you know? <laughs> so, so excellent. I trusted you and you did well. 
<laughs> Thank you. So before we get started um, with our questions, I just wanted to share with some of our audience here a little bit of your work. So I did find um, some of the creative that you've done, and I'm going to share one today, um, okay. and then we'll get into it. Okay. So go ahead and share my screen. Hey, good morning, Valerie. <laughs> good morning. <laughs> Uh oh. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's it's in the 50s over here in Chicago. So hopefully it's coming that way. <laughs> it, 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 yes, it's very warm this morning and sunny, and they're looking for it to get closer to 70. So I'm thankful for that in March. All right. Cool. <laughs> okay. I'll go ahead and get started. You know, I, I loved it for so many reasons. I love the story aspect of it. And as a mom, I have a daughter and I was just really um, inspired with the daughter learning to box and just kind of her uncertainty when she first got there. But, you know, how she just kind of transitioned into total confidence. So I really love that. Do you want to even, you know, I didn't even plan to ask you this question, but if you wanted to kind of share with us a little bit about where you were coming from with that message in the commercial. Sure. Great. Well, so let's start it. Thanks. Thanks, Candy, uh, Candace, and great, great uh, choice. Uh, one of the things that starts with the agency's philosophy called uh, positive realism. And since we are a Black agency, one of the things we always want to do is portray our consumers in a very positive way. So to your point, as a mom, you saw, very importantly, a Black dad with his daughter spending time in a non-traditional girls, girls, I do that in quotes, ladies, role. Right. So that was something very fresh and said a lot. And from a product perspective, we were trying to get over the point that even though it's chicken McNuggets, this is a healthy meal for kids because this is a very active kid. And for what she can have for lunch is a very safe, you know, uh, quality snack. So all of that. But it's um, so what's interesting that is a real father and daughter. And what was fantastic was that uh, I'll get into where I'm from later. And, uh, but that guy, we shot it in LA, LA and we was talking to the father. And he's actually from my hometown. And I'm from a small hometown in Georgia. We'll talk about that later. So here you are in big LA, you shoot with a big time director and you're talking all of a sudden you're having lunch and you know, hey, you're from the same little town that I'm from. It was just really amazing and interesting how this, this industry can do magical things like that. That's awesome. And she's an awesome little girl. You saw those sit-ups. I mean, you know, she just <laughs> came from the floor, came straight up. I'm like, oh, my God. She's a, I, I don't know, she's a future Olympian. <laughs> the whole thing was awesome. And like I said, I just, I like the relationship. And I also saw a little bit of protection there from mm -hmm. him, like making sure that she felt comfortable in the environment that she was in and she was, you know, ready to go while working, but still I'm here to make sure as your, as your dad, that I'm here to protect you. Yeah. Cause so often you just don't see black men in a positive role like that. And this, is so true. this is so true. And, nor, and also um, focus on the father daughter relationship, you know, mm -hmm. versus the mother daughter or mother and children mm -hmm. and so forth. So uh -huh. I, really like the imagery there and like I said it just I looked at all of them and I was like I don't know which one to pick but I can't show them all <laughs> so that one was the one that just resonated with me the most 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so going back a little bit, you said you're going to talk about where you're from. Um, I noticed that when I was doing some research on you that you were from Macon, Georgia. So tell me a little bit about kind of like where you come from and what the transition to Kent State in Ohio. So not only did you come <laughs> to Ohio, but you came to a small place in Ohio. So what was that transition like? Oh, this is kind of interesting. Macon, Georgia, the home of Little Richard. Uh, the home of uh, Otis Redding, if some of you young people may not know who those people are, <laughs> uh, Nancy Grace, you know what I mean? Uh, so uh, you got to think about uh, a town that's small of 100,000 people who put out iconic people like a little Richard and uh, Otis Redding. So that's pretty interesting. Um, the, the road to, to Kent and Ohio and why we're talking today uh, was a road I never saw. I mean, you know, coming from a small town, all I knew that I could draw. And it's my passion for art and drawing that took me to here. Um, being there in Georgia, it wasn't a lot of schools. Uh, fortunately, I was in a program called Upward Bound. I don't know if anybody familiar with Upward Bound, where they take <laughs> poor students and give them an opportunity. I didn't know I was poor because, you know, we... <laughs> Mom and dad was just fine, but I guess from the government <laughs> rules, I was a poor kid. But anyway, <laughs> um, well, I got an opportunity to join Upward Bound, and they took us and exposed us to so many things. And one of the things they stressed was that you have to do something after high school. And I went to um, I went to um, a college recruitment um, convention. They took us to a college recruitment convention in Atlanta, and it was all these colleges was there. And I remember just, you know, you're talking to everybody and I had all these books and I went to the Kent State table because they was giving out these cool bags. So I only went to talk to them so I could get a bag to put my other stuff in. You know, that's the only reason. <laughs> so, but you had to go through the process, right? But right. what was very interesting at that time, you know, and, and I'm a baby boomer, so they really was, the public white institutions were really looking for black kids. Next Three, four or five days, I got a note from Kent State and another note. I kept getting these letters from, from Kent State. And I also applied to Howard, you know what I mean? Because I knew Howard had a good art program. But I kept getting these letters from Kent State. And I like, they like me. They really like me. They just kept sending me stuff. And so that's important for people. When you engage people, they feel mm -hmm. like I'm seen, right? So anyway, it went on and I got accepted into the art program. And... Um, and uh, it was unfortunately because I never heard anything from Howard after I accepted the money to go to Kent. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> and then you're like, like, oh, yeah. <laughs> I said, like, come on, Black people, get that stuff in the mail a little sooner. You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it, would, it would have been a very different path had I gone to Howard. You know what I mean? So, right. Uh, you know, so, but uh, it was just interesting. Going to Kent State was very traumatic. Uh, it was traumatic that I was a Southern boy. Mm -hmm. And you think I talk country now, you should have heard me back in the 70s. People made fun of me from Cleveland, you know what I mean? <laughs> and, you know, it was very hard because I had never really been that far away from home. Mm -hmm. I've never got the opportunity to um, visit Kent State because I just couldn't. We couldn't afford to fly up for a weekend and fly back. Mm -hmm. So when I went up there, we loaded up the car and parents dropped me off and that was it. So I had a school I have never seen, a state I had never been in, I'm way up north, you know what I mean? So, yeah. <laughs> and I had to, you know, go from there. But uh, it was a really good experience. Had never been in the snow. I didn't know you had snowshoes. I went to class one day and was snowing in tennis shoes, and I slipped and fell the entire way because I didn't know that you're supposed to have boots. It was just, it was, you know. <laughs> Not <to learn. laughs> yeah. And I swore to God, I'd never live in a place with snow. And here I am in Chicago. In Chicago. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, they had a very excellent uh, art program. So I, I majored in, in design at Kent State. So now I, I have to ask you just because Kent State is so close to here. Have you ever uh -huh. been to Toledo? I have never been, but I had a lot of friends from Toledo. I, and I wonder, did you have any, you know, connections here? Um, so... No, so knowing that you started in the arts program at Kent State, how did you get into advertising? And that was another road I didn't see. Um, majoring, majoring in design, I thought I was going to be designing annual reports, logos, and things like that, you know. 
Um, I didn't know what advertising was, even in design, because again, we were about design, making things look pretty, redesigning airport signage, all, you know, those kinds of things, logos for American Airlines. Mm -hmm. um, so I moved to um, California because I had a friend who moved to San Diego, like, hey, you know, so I went back home, saved some money, moved to, uh, to San Diego, California, and you just start looking for work. You just calling up people in the den call yellow pages. <laughs> so you just looking and you just calling, cold calling, cold calling. And you know, whoever you can get an interview, you get an interview with. And um, I remember I was out there, I had about money to last me for three months and I was down to my last week. And I finally got an interview. And I was just a couple of days from calling back to George and say, mom, dad, can y'all send me a ticket and I'm coming back home. So, but I went in and um, I was um, interviewing and um, I was talking to the president of the agency and he was reading my resume. He said, hmm, he says, uh, I see you from Macon, Georgia. I said, yes, sir, I am. He looked at me and said, so am I. I said, oh, Jesus, please hire this player. Hire <laughs> me. Hire me, man. I'm way out here in California. Please hire me. <laughs> And and uh, and he did, and he did, and um, but it was an advertising agency, not a design agency. Mm -hmm. And so I get in, and I was just working just um, people who put together called the production artists. So I'm just basically putting together things for art directors and writers. And through that, I just began to observe what they were doing, and it was very different from design. It's like this thing called a headline. This thing, you know, the photograph and some of the stuff make me laugh. Some of the stuff make me cry. We didn't do that kind of in design, right? It was all about looking pretty. And I go, I kind of think that's interesting, you know? And uh, one day I stayed after work and I sneaked in one of the big boys' office and I went through their portfolio and I just saw all the great stuff. It's like, wow, I love that headline. I love that twist on wordplay. I go, I think I want to do that. And from that, I just started letting them know I wanted to do it. I got the little things. I started doing great things with the little things, mm -hmm. you know? And then all of a sudden, like, he's kind of good with the little things. And the little things got bigger. And the little things got bigger. And those things got bigger, bigger, bigger. Next thing you know, I'm an art director. So I left there after about three years and got a job at a, as an art director at another small agency. And here we are. Wow. So that is interesting in that kind of at the heart of what you were doing was design. And through that, you discovered what your real passion was, which is still somewhat connected to design because now you just kind of oversee right. what designers do, but you were able to offer more um, mm -hmm. to that. So I really like that. And I mean, I can definitely attest to that even in my career, kind of honing in on what part of public relations I love the most and where I feel mm -hmm. like my strengths are. Um, you know, Candace, can I interrupt for one second? Sure, sure. What I did not know is that I was an art director all the time. I just didn't know it. I just didn't know it because I had never seen that before. But even in my design, I always had some type of message to it. And I just didn't know I was all the time. I was an art director in hiding. But since you don't know that exists, you don't know what exists. What it is and now, okay, that's something and I think that's something that everybody listening can probably take from that is like, you know, who are you already and it just needs to be, like, it needs to come out. It's just in there waiting to come out with the right opportunity for you to be exposed to what it is that you really should be doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay, so we talked about getting into advertising. Tell us a little bit more about some of your earlier careers and some, maybe in those careers, some uh, roadblocks that you had to overcome. And still trying to overcome. <laughs> well, you know, it's, I tell you, it's, this is very interesting, you know, um, working at a black agency and, and, and being in this business as long as you sort of like become a cultural anthropologist, you know what I mean? And you start seeing how a lot of things work. Uh, being in, being raised in the South, uh, I even noticed this in college. I got along with white people better. The black people from Cleveland was kind of coming down and it was acting all bad, you know, because they'd never been around white people. They had just stayed in their area. So they kind of was trying to hide that insecurity by being badasses. Mm. In the South, you have to negotiate with white people. You know, like my, you know, like my mother was a maid at the Dunwoody home. And you had this thing, it's like if, if, um, if the white people gave you 
hey, uh, Miss Williams, here's some old dresses and stuff like that. And you say, thank you, and you take them home. Even though you don't need them, you know the person down the street needs them. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? My father had a brand new car. He never drove to work because he didn't want them to know how well he was doing. Mm -hmm. So, we, you know, Black people, if you saw Driving Miss Daisy, it's kind of interesting to see the relationship mm -hmm. that Black people and white people have. One minute is disrespect, the other minute is most respected. Mm -hmm. My mother, who was a uh, domestic worker, maid in the white people's house, was the most trusted person in the house. When my mother passed, the mayor of Macon spoke at her funeral. Why? Because he married the daughter of one of the girls <laughs> of the family that she had raised. And he got up there and told a story. He said, when I went home to meet her parents, she looked at me and said, I know my mom and dad are gonna like you, but Miss Nora is gonna be the one to tell me. And my mother approved him and there he was. So it's just, it's that kind of relationship. So what I'm saying is that, so when I went to Kent and working through being uh, oftentimes the only black person in the agency, and that very first job I talked about, was the receptionist was black and I was black and that was it out of about 75 people. So how do you, how do you negotiate that? How do you go to lunch? How do you laugh, you know, to be that only person and still be black but at the same time, not give up who you are. And yeah. everybody, that situation is very difficult. And that's what you see now with a lot of uh, the agencies hiring young black talent, but they can't retain them later because they don't have people to help them negotiate and work through that. You know what I mean? So that's why it's important to have people that look like you at general market agencies, you know? So anyway, so the roadblocks, you know, it, it's always was this thing about you didn't know whether or not they was telling the truth or not. You know, we really love your book, Candace. Oh, you really great. Oh, we love to have you here. But they never hear back. You never hear back. Right. So yeah. and then, you know, at the end of the day, what's that's all about. Right. You know what I mean? But you have to keep your head down and keep going. So, I mean, the roadblocks and it, it's just the roadblocks in society, the same roadblocks in society. Uh, happens in the industry, if, if not that. Um, but what you have to do is just ignore the roadblocks and keep going. Um, what I just found is that if you're good and you're passionate and you don't have any excuses, you would eventually knock down those roadblocks. It may take a little longer and you have to have allies. I mean, every time um, to get around roadblocks, I made sure that I had somebody that saw me as Lewis. Mm -hmm. And every agency I went to, I found that person who would give me the benefit of the doubt or give me that opportunity. So that's how I got around those roadblocks. And I heard some, you know, I remember one time I was on a conference call that was back before Zoom. And I've heard things said by clients and they didn't know I was a black person in the room because you couldn't tell. Because I, at that time I was young, so I wasn't allowed to speak that much, you know, in those big meetings. And I've heard things come from clients, you know, that was like, and everybody kind of look at the room and, then all of a sudden you get a call later saying, oh, Louis, he's so sorry that, you know, I go, hey, it's okay. You know, the truth is the truth. I'm not surprised. But I come from the South, I had heard it all. You know what I mean? So that stuff that stuff didn't slow me down. And so thinking about that, have you ever, and this is a question, I'm sorry, I, I <laughs> came to me, um, but I'm sure you probably have experienced or maybe not. Has any of those situations ever challenged you? Like, is this where I want to be? You know, do I want to um, help? Because some of the times that I've, I've spoken to groups here, mm -hmm. I talk about as an agency, when you support organizations that you know um, where the organization's mission and heart lies. So are you going to be complicit when you work with people that you know are trying to not further their roles as it relates to diversity. So if you have a company that you know has had a racist comment and you know that right now they're just trying to spin it, they really don't have a true desire to change. They just wanna get the media off their backs right now. And so for me, I struggle with reaching out to say, yes, I wanna help you because I know you're not legitimately trying to change. You're using me, the African-American face to help you recover from a mistake that you've made that really wasn't a mistake. It was just your truth leaking out. And so in the design world, and like you sit on a conversation like that and mm -hmm. you hear, you know, people saying what they really feel, have you ever been challenged with that to say, I don't know if I want to work with this company because I don't want to work with people like that? Not at all. 
because, you know, I wanted to be great at what I do. I had a passion for what I do. That's life. Everybody's not going to like you. I mean, it's, it's sort of, we live in America. And if you don't know by now there's racial tension in this country that would never go away, that it's sort of like uh, I was, one of the rappers said, racism is the air we breathe. So get over it. Now, what you do is like, you, you say, well, you want to use me? That could go both ways. I can use you. We, let's use each other out of this relationship. You know what I mean? Because one of the reasons I got that very first job that I found out later was that they was in the middle of a lawsuit, lawsuit that they had had a black employee there. And they he was suing them. Mm. So they had to make sure they had at least one when they went to court that they could put, hey, see? We, <laughs> we got one. <laughs> But that was, you know what I mean? So that may have been their main reason for giving me a break, but I still, the guy from Macon was very genuine. So that was genuine, right? So I think it was a plus. Because, I, you know what? That's right. Somebody said, wow, it just worked out. I was like, I just worked out for them. I was good and I was black. So they didn't have to, you know, so it worked out for them. So, so, so we used each other. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, if I need to be that person, that's fine. But I still was who I was, right? So as you moved along then, mm -hmm. do you, did you find that over time that evolved? Like where, you know, when you started, there were companies that were trying to check a box. Whereas now, do you see companies that legitimately would like to diversify their workforce? Like before it was like, we just need a person here. Now it's like, we're really consciously trying to make efforts to change our, our company culture and structure. But when I started, they didn't give. They didn't. They didn't care about checking boxes. Nobody was telling them to check boxes. Check box. They didn't. Ha they didn't have to check boxes. There wasn't no box to check. You know what I mean? They didn't get in any trouble. Nobody did a head count. The, the industry was not looking at itself. This only recently that we've had all of this fury of checking boxes and all of that stuff. So the young black people now is coming at a really good time where the eyes of the world and the industry is looking at that and, and, and companies are saying things out loud. But when I started, you couldn't get in no trouble. You know what I mean? Well, you know what I mean? Same thing for women. So what? Be in the secretary pool, baby. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, I'm talking white women too. You know what I mean? They ain't gotten to the sisters yet. You know yeah. what I mean? So at that time, I was coming up and it was like, you know, diversity and inclusion, what was that? You know, it wasn't even a department called that. That mm -hmm. concept didn't even exist at that time. Because companies didn't, they didn't have to. Like, they didn't have to. Have to. <laughs> and so, to. so knowing that, um, one of the questions when I, and I kind of asking, you kind of touched on it, but I'll just go ahead and ask. What have you noticed that has started to change in this industry in general? And then what have you noticed in terms of diversity? Well, in so general, like we have, okay, go ahead, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say in general, uh, unrelated to diversity or any of that, just in general. Okay. Well, in okay. Well, it's interesting. What, what has changed is like, again, the role of women your role, and the role of black women, the role of people in color. Uh, people, but what's interesting is just as an industry is just the use of black culture in marketing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the use of black culture in marketing. You know, I re, it was in the '90s that if you, um, if everybody look at uh, LL Cool J's "Round the uh, Round the Way Girl" video, and you see this white girl in overalls dancing, you go like, "Why is that white girl in there?" We talk about "Round the Way Girl." Why is a white girl in round the way girl Fendi bad and a bad attitude? Because somebody because if, said we got to have her in here. MTV <laughs> said you cannot run a video on MTV unless it has white people in it. And that was in the 90s. Mm. So, you know what I mean? That's MTV that was supposed to be the coolest, most advanced thing on television, right? So you, you, right now, what's really different is just the, the, the influx of youth, the black culture. And of course, you cannot look away from technology. Technology changed everything. All the different platforms, you know, mm -hmm. you know, right from Facebook to Twitter to Instagram to TikTok to, you know, everything has just changed it. And that really changed everything. Everything was sort of moving and that just <laughs> blew everything up, right? 
But very interesting, Candace, and I wrote this note down, it's like the more things change, the more they remain the same. You know, because in this whole technology world and the industry has changed and everything, you still got the creation of the Black Lives Movement, Black Lives Matter Movement in the midst. So why does should that exist? We're talking about, we deep into the millennium now. This is 2021. Why are we talking about stuff that was dealing with this little black kid from Georgia, you know, in the 70s? We're talking about that in 2021. Mm -hmm. So the more things change, the more they remain the same. But technology really, really did it. And just the influx, uh, influx of black culture in marketing, you know, leading marketing, you know, whether you got black people there or not, doesn't matter. It's mm -hmm. just the force. That's been the biggest thing. Okay. And so um, do you, and I'm sure you have a good answer for this, what work still needs to be done and specific to uh, the marketing, advertising, design, and, and so forth, those kinds of creative industries, what work still needs to be done? Well, we've never done anything. I, I think we, we, we kind of think in our head that we've done things, but we really haven't, you know what I mean? So and I, and I talk, I think of, there's no silver bullet. I think we look, you know, we say, what can be done? What will be done? I mean, it's, we can't snap our fingers. Nobody can come up with a plan because we're people. You know what I mean? We're people. Uh, you can see from the election, I'm not take this side and take this side. The nation is split in the middle, which means that the attitude of America is strong. Right side, left side. So, we're talking people that's 15, 16 years old, because what's interesting when you say what can be done, I don't know what the answer is because I was looking at, um, everybody heard of Woodstock and the young people, if not, go find out what that is. But Woodstock was a moment when, you know, 300 some thousand people, young people came together for three or four days in upstate New York and sang songs. It was so cool. Where did those people go? Cause they my age now and older. So if they had that attitude in the 60s and early 70s, that whole wave should have gone through America and changed all of that. What happened? So everything still needs to be done. On the surface, do you know, I see people that look like me more. Yes. Uh, young black kids get an opportunity to, to do things that they wouldn't have never done before. Yes. But at the same time, there's still other barriers, you know, and the hidden barriers. So you, but you were in the process of saying, you know, what can be done? And you really didn't have an answer to that. And then I guess because there, there are some people on here who actually yeah. um, are leaders locally, yeah. um, who do national work and mm -hmm. are probably here to find out what they can do, they can um, do. To, to be a part of a change. But what I would say that, Candace, but, you know, not just being flippant like you can't do anything, but I think... Just one step at a time, one person at a time. You know what I mean? It's like if you give that person a chance, one of the things I just be an ally, pick one person because, you know, that one person that helped me and all the allies that I've had, and I look at my position now and all the young people I've been able to affect, right? So all you need, don't, don't let, if you think about how can I change this world, you can't. Only thing you can do is how can you deal with that person right in front of you? How can you make your environment that you are in, in control of the best that you can be? You know what I mean? Because again, there's no silver bullet, no magic pill. It's just we, it comes down to each individual as a person, you know, and, and understand that uh, people have different backgrounds, set up that environment. Um, don't be afraid. One of the things I see for a lot of allies, I don't want people to feel as though people get a pass. You know, like don't don't give don't give. We don't need charity here. We need good people to break through. Don't be afraid if you're working with someone, male, female, person of color, and that person isn't cutting it. Then you need to tell them they're not cutting it. You know, what I mean, don't try to appease them and just kind of move them along because you may feel guilty or you may think that they're going to take it. No, no, that's you can be honest. You can say, you know, Candace. I got to be honest with you. You're really not that good at this, but you're very damn good at that. Yeah. So, you know, I'm going to let you go, but I'm going to suggest that you go do that. And that could be the best advice you ever got. And then now you go running your own thing. You know what I mean? So 
that's what I would say. Just one step at a time, the person in front of you, control the environment that you have. Because like your mama said, you ain't got nothing to do with those people's house across the street. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Just make sure that your house is in order. Mm -hmm. And if everybody get their houses in order, pretty soon the whole block, then the whole neighborhood, then the whole city, then the state and the country and the world will go like that. So again, just do what you can do in front of you and what you believe in your own personal belief and just simply just be fair and respect another human being. And that's it. It's just that simple. I love that. That's wonderful advice. One thing that I noticed, um, and you brought just brought that up when you talked about young people, and um, you and I are now connected on LinkedIn. And mm -hmm. I noticed that seems to be something you feel very strongly about now is helping young Black creatives find their way and get connected. And um, can you tell us more about what it is that you're doing and how you're trying to support young creatives? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, I, I, from, when I, from hiring them, you know, that's one thing at Burrell. Um, I, I, we call ourselves the uh, HBCU advertising agencies. You know what I mean? You know, we get people on scholarship. You know, I've, I've had to, I've had interns come in, you know, I have to pay their rent, you know what I mean? And, and, and uh, pay, give them a bus pass. But I'm also working with uh, the One Club out of New York. And we have, um, we have, um, a school called One School, where it's a free school for 18 students that the One Club is, is just giving opportunity uh, for these kids to, to take a, I think, a 16-week class. I'm going to be teaching that starting in April. They've already done one in New York successfully. They did one in LA. Now they're doing one in Chicago and Atlanta. So kids can uh, go put in a portfolio. These are kids that hadn't been to school that can't go to the extensive art schools. These are just raw kids that we're going to just get them and we're going to teach them for like, uh, I think, 16, 18 weeks or whatever, and then put them out there. Right now, the first wave has graduated and a lot of those kids are getting jobs. You know what I mean? So that's really what I'm doing. That's and then I, I always make myself available. You know, and I talked to uh, this lady this evening, I'm talking to some kids at some black kids at DePaul. So whenever I can go speak, whenever I can go talk, you know what I mean? I'll, I'll do what I can and, and, and just, and even when I get them with me at the real, I still am that teacher. You know what I mean? So just, I'm just doing what I can. Keep it going. I love that. And that that's amazing because it's not often that someone at your level in their career and just in their organization mm -hmm. is willing to take time themselves. I think a lot of executives will say someone on my team can do it or, you know, I'll send someone to, you know, you know, you send it. Like when I sent you a message, I really didn't know. I was surprised you responded to me. I thought it would be, you know, someone in between us that would handle, you know, that's how come I didn't know, like, should I copy your assistant? Because I'm like, should I be asking him for a playlist or should I ask her? I mean, I really don't know. But throughout this process, you've been very hands on. And that is so important because you're the one with all the experience that one day you're going to decide, okay, I'm not going to work anymore, but who's going to still be leading the industry? And you're making sure the industry is still going to be in good hands. And I love mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. and, and it's mm -hmm. so appreciated and so necessary. And I hope people who are on this Zoom that are running organizations or, you know, senior in their companies are also considering that your expertise is the most valuable to incoming, you know, people into the industry because you have a wealth of multi-level experience because you know what it's like to be a beginner, but you know what it's like to be in management, the kinds of things when you were a manager, what kind of manager did you need and want and to be able to be that person. So I think that's really incredible and that they can go, um, and bypass the college experience, which is very expensive. And you're helping also prevent debt for them because a lot of times they'll try to go to the university and take out loans and, you know, end up coming out of college at a deficit. So this is also, you know, really, and I'm thinking this obviously because I work for a school district, I'm thinking of that, you know, just generational impact just from you touching those 18 students now what that can mean for their families and their children and so forth. And they will mm -hmm. sew into somebody because of mm -hmm. how you sewed into them. So I just think mm -hmm. that's amazing. Thank you. So um, last couple of things I have for you, what has been your biggest professional hurdle and what do you hold as your best or few best accomplishments? 
My probably biggest professional hurdle has been me. Um, you know, of understanding who I am. Um, you know, uh, early in the career, you look timid. You know what I mean? You, you understanding how to navigate stuff. So I put that on me, you know, but, you know, it's just, that's it. You know, I, I don't put that on anybody else. You know what I mean? Because that's, that's what people do. You have a, you deflect. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's because Candace didn't do that. Because Daryl didn't do that. Tiana didn't let me do that. They didn't let me, they didn't, you know, you know, it, it's been my hurdle. You know what I mean? Uh, so I, I take all that on. Uh, so what was your other question though? What, that one what, what do you hold as your best? or a few best accomplishments? Because sometimes there are more than one. Yeah. Okay. Wow. <clears throat> My best accomplishment is a very simple one. My daddy came home, work, he worked outside. It was a cold day in February. You know, cold in Georgia than normal. So he came home, and my mother fixed him a warm plate. And my father came home like he worked. You know what I mean? I come home clean, all of us. My father came home, he looked like he worked. He was dirty, he was sweaty, he was smelling. Mm -hmm. He came home and he looked at me one day on that really cold day in Georgia in February. And he said, son, whatever you do, get a job inside. And I looked at him and I saw the sacrifice. Somebody who went to the fourth grade. I'm doing this for you. So I got a job inside. That's it. Mm. The power in that. I'm like, I because and, and it's because when I think about families of parents, especially people now who have reaped so many benefits of the sacrifice of our parents, of our grandparents. I was raised by my grandmother and she did hair for a living. And I grew up in a salon watching people get their hair done, getting my hair done. She would freak out if she saw me wearing my natural hair right now because I started getting a relaxer <laughs> and getting my hair pressed when I was like five. So she would be like, what is happening on top of your head? Like right now, she would not be, she would not approve if she was still here. But her, when I grew up, as I got older, we had a vocational school here that offered cosmetology. And I was like, I'm going to school to do hair. And she was like, no, you are not. You're not going to be standing on your feet all day working for nobody. You get a job where you telling people what to do, not people telling you what to do. And so that's why that touched me because we have all like benefited from hard sacrifices of our parents. And when people say, you know, I'm my parents or I'm my ancestors' wildest dreams, we literally are. And I think that this um, conversation just kind of proved that because I'm nowhere near where you are in my career, but we have so many things that are so similar just in our lives and our upbringing. And I think that can go across, you know, cultures and just um, across just industries. It's just a common thing that I think as black people that we share. Um, so you know, Candace, to, to your point is that so often we kind of get caught up in our own underwear. We thinking we, oh, we big advertising people. We do this. Da, 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 da. You, you know what I mean? Who gives a flying? You, you know what I'm saying? You know, <laughs> I was I with just, you. <laughs> you know, I, I just got a job working inside. You know what I mean? That's all. Let's just yeah. boil it down to that. You know what yeah. I mean? And stop thinking that we are this great thing and we these special people and all of that kind of stuff. We were lucky. We had people to, you know what I mean? Let's keep it basic. You know what I mean? So, you know, I just like to keep it grounded. You know what I mean? So. It is it's so appreciated and so many more people I wish could be more like that in their thinking. Um, at the world, I just think the world, corporate America, and just the workplace would be such mm -hmm. a better place for a lot of people if more people thought like that. So we're at the end of our conversation because I know there are going to be a lot of questions for you. And we've told everybody at the end, they can ask questions. Um, fast five. And if you don't have five, that's fine. But who are the top five creatives that we all should know about? Top five creatives? Well, it's, well, it's going to be an interesting one because... Um, they may not be in advertising. You know what I mean? That, that's the thing, right? 
you know, I got, you know, I got some good friends. I mean, I got, you know, a friend of mine, Jimmy Smith, uh, is a really great, uh, person. Um, I got, um, you know, I look at, I'm just trying to, hmm. Oh God, Jesus Christ. I look at, um, Lisa Ray, you know what I mean? Creative wise. I was looking at the TikTok creators, and I mean, maybe more groups of people than individuals. You know, I was looking at the black TikTok creators. Like, I forgot that young lady who created the dance. What's that dance called? The Renegade. The Renegade. Yeah, yeah I was you know watching I mean? her last night. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's that kind of creativity that I'm, I'm, so I'm seeing it more in groups than I'm seeing it in individuals. Mm -hmm. You know, because we kind of away from that time where we kind of had those superstars now. I mean, it's, it's sort of like pretty diverse now. Right. You know, we used to have two or three singers, two or three athletes. You know, it's LeBron, but it's the whole NBA. You know what I mean? That's really making making a move as an entity, you know what I mean, versus these individuals, because that's where we are now. It's more movements and disciplines that creativity is coming from versus that one lead individual. You know, mm -hmm. it used to be Martin Luther King would stand up and talk to us all, but now it's so many groups representing racial justice. Yes. You know what I mean? So that's the world we live in now versus individuals. Okay. I love that. And I do, I've, I've really been enjoying that series. And um, I just made that recommendation to a, a group of people that I had a chance to talk to just mm -hmm. about checking out this series on ABC called Soul of a Nation is mm -hmm. really a, a lens into our culture, but from a historical standpoint, but then how they connected to where we are today. It's just been really mm -hmm. interesting. And, you know, it's got music, even just how they talked about shoe culture. Um, yeah, yeah. How, how critical that is to uh, African American and Black culture. So um, I got a nice set of pan, pan leather Jordans over there. That's one of my prizes. So, <laughs> so that's, you like Jordans. Oh, you gotta like Jordans, man. <laughs> what, what else is there? You know, Kobe's cool, Braun is cool, but some J's, man. You gotta have some J's. Yeah, you absolutely. You can't, you know, you can't even be in this conversation. If you don't got a few pair of cool J's, just, just go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, so now do you want to um, read the questions, Valerie, because we're in the Q&A, or do you want to let people unmute themselves or? Because you do have a question now in the chat. We can kind of toggle and do both, but since um, since Asha asked her question, we'll go ahead and start there. Okay. Do you think advanced degrees are important in your industry? And if so, what type of master degree is sought after? Not at all. I, I, it, well, I won't say not at all. It depends on what you want to do. If you are creative, no. Because I, I, I started working on my master's at Syracuse. And I went there and I go like, this is a total waste of my time. <laughs> you, know, cause, you know, I mean, because you're in the real world, right? You know, you're in the real world and that's where your masters are coming from. You know, you can't go in a, in a controlled environment and learn at this level. You need to be in front of people, reacting to people in real life, in real time. Mm -hmm. You go back to school for your masters in creative and stuff like that, it's made up stuff. Your master's going to be when a client yells at you, you go like, do I yell back or not? You know, you know, what is the, you know, that's your master's and you, it's not, you can't, you can't recreate that in a classroom. So, but if you want to go into education or something like that, then you're going to, that's how you're going to benefit me, you know, because now people do care. Where did you get your master's from? You know, so that's important. But if you're in a creative field and it's, it's the work, it's the work that you're going to do. LeBron didn't go to college. <laughs> He was a high school graduate. Do we need to say any more? No. I mean, he's a basketball player, but he's a businessman. You know what I mean, right? So, so you just got to know what do you want to do, and you got to look at yourself and say, will this really help me for what I plan to do? And Asha's part two to her comment, her question was that content creation and social media is that something you need advanced degree for? No, because that's that goes like this. That's creativity, right? I mean, we talked about the girl, little girl in the renegade. I mean, hell, she hadn't gotten out of high school. So how can she go get a master? She did it in high school. So that's about understanding human behavior, what entertains people, you know, things like that. Now, if you go and work on your master's in psychology, because why would people, why are people taking a dance off a platform and trying to beat somebody else doing it? Mm -hmm. And you got to say, well, huh, did it, don't we all have something else to do? 
<laughs> if you go, when you look at TikTok, you, you really have to ask yourself, what the fuck? Are, I mean, I'm, what are we doing here? You got to say, can I go feed the dog, walk the dog? Can I do something? Then go twerk, you know, or something. You, you just got to ask yourself. You know, all of us want to wonder, like, why is this worth $100 billion? You know what I mean? You just got to ask yourself. But there's a reason why. So if you're going to go and understand the psychology of that and what it's really tapping into, then that's worth going to getting your master's from. But other than that, just, you know, do the renegade and pass it on. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's a great segue into our, uh, into our <laughs> webinar tomorrow. WTF is TikTok. We're doing it. <laughs> yeah, 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 I saw that. <laughs> Um, okay, so next question. Um, Bethany Arn asks, if someone finds themselves in an advertising role almost by accident because they happen to be the most creative person in a startup company, do you have any advice for them in general, but also specifically how not to get overwhelmed? Mm -hmm. What I tell everybody, when you do that, be a student. And I think one of the things now that we have at our disposal is this thing, this Google thing that really become a student so often and, and understand that people have been doing this for years. So don't take on the pressure of being overwhelmed, like, oh my, oh my God, I got to figure this out by myself. It's so many tools, so many articles that you could just push a button to make yourself feel better. How to navigate through this. Just put in the question and then it's probably a pop up, right? So it's so much self-education that you can do, right? And also be honest with yourself. It's like, don't allow people to push you quicker or further than you need to do. You need to say, okay, you, I'm the most creative person, but I don't know how to do this. Can you give me money so I can take a class on this? You know what I mean? So don't take on the weight of your shoulders. Say, look, okay, I love to do this, but I'm not qualified just yet. Mm -hmm. Know where you are. Don't try to fake it. Say, hey. And then you go learn those things. Then you grow. You seek out the people who know things. You know what I mean? There's just so much stuff out there to learn. So refuse to be, you know, to take on the world. But take your passion and, and you, you, you're off to a good start, right? So because so many people I see learn incorrectly and they become bad leaders later. Mm -hmm. You know? So you don't want to be that bad leader later. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent answer. Um, next question. You talked about how you didn't know you wanted to be an art director because you didn't know the position existed. What is the best way in 2021 to expose Black youth to some of these positions and turn them on to jobs in the ad industry? Hmm. Um, talk to them. I, I mean, you know, I mean, you got to go to the schools and talk to them. I mean, and show them, you know what I mean? And because I, when I talk to young people, I say, okay, who's the rapper in here? I say, who's the best, who's the best wordsmith? Everybody to point to. That's Joe over there. Okay, Joe, you know what? You're probably a writer. Now, who's who's the boss lady? Who in there like to always, when y'all gonna go somewhere, who's the first one saying, you gonna do this over here, Candace? And 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 and, and Valerie, you gonna go do that? Who who's the boss? Who always bossing people around here? That's Sharon. Sharon, you know, you probably be a good account person. You know what I mean? It's like, who can sing over here? Oh, that's Stephanie. Stephanie, say something now. Say something. Oh, Stephanie, you know what? You might be a music person. You know what I mean? So letting them, pulling those things out, what they're already doing, mm -hmm. and say, wow, now let me show you in this commercial, or let me show you in this, whatever we have, to show you where those things are playing themselves out. That when you look at a TV commercial or you look at a movie, you never look at it the same. You know somebody wrote those words. When they sit there, you you started crying. You know, those people didn't just get on camera. Somebody wrote those words for them to say that. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, but they're getting a little bit more familiar because, again, this iPhone is letting them do some of these things themselves. So they're a lot closer now than ever. But just let them know and how that particular role can play out in real life. And then they can begin to imagine themselves doing those things because they, you know, just know that they exist. That's the main thing. You have to know that it exists. And that's true. Cause I definitely, when I went to school and ended up majoring in communications, it was literally just do a career assessment. And I took, you know, started taking classes and found out that I enjoyed it. 
but it wasn't until I actually started working that I knew certain areas within PR, like crisis management, media relations, those kinds of things existed. And you know, when you're, you know, growing up, things are happening, you know, it's news on TV, but you never even comprehend, well, how does the news even get the information that they're reporting? You know, so it is a, a thing of just exposure. And then with your talents, here's some things you can do. Because when you said, I just knew I like to draw. And so if you think, I just know I like to draw, how does that translate into, you know, an award-winning design career where you're at the top of your class? You know, looking that far ahead, you would never think that. So we have actually, we are right at time, but I feel like I just wish I could go on and on and on <laughs> so much to learn. And you have, oh, Marlene says, thank you as a fellow Kent State VCD grad. I All said, right, girl, Molly. <laughs> Ask Molly. So who is your teacher? Really hearing you speak, love your point of view and talent, and she has to go to another meeting. But okay, uh, she got. She, you got to let me know who did she, what year she graduated and all that kind of stuff. So, uh, and I cool. oh, I mean, she must have cut out right after she said okay. no because I don't okay. see her in here. But we can find okay. out. Okay, um, fine. Okay. But I just want to thank you for taking the time. Oh, Asha says, I won't hold it against you. I'm from Cleveland and went to Howard. <laughs> and Asha's daughter, Asha's daughter is new to the uh, marketing and advertising industry, which is, um, I'm thinking, probably why she asked you those questions. That's good. That's good. Okay. Personal yeah. friend and colleague of mine. So, um, but just okay. thank you. This has been um, an overwhelming experience talking to you i was so excited like leading up to it i was just like preparing and watching things and just, <laughs> you know kind of trying to make sure i was really ready for today and i'm so glad everything went better than i expected even and um like i said i just really appreciate your time taking time to talk to the people of toledo and and clearly we have some people here who are not from toledo that just kind of checked in to hear you speak uh, people that I know only found out about this yesterday that are here. So I appreciate them being here and just appreciate your time and everything that you've given. I think that people can really take some really good nuggets away and go back into their workplace and just be better. Thanks. Thanks, Candace and Valerie. Thanks for inviting me. Really nice. I'm, I'm very accessible, as you said. So, you know, it's nice while we're stuck at home, you know, might as well talk to somebody right so, yeah. so. I wish I was still stuck at home but I every day trying to rush to get the kids you back know. to school so that means back to work too <laughs> that is good but uh, everybody just hit me up anytime on LinkedIn to talk and, and stuff like that even from a leadership sometimes I've had these conversations with C CMOs and you know I said CMOs we're hurting you know our black employees are we're trying to be professional on the inside but on the you know on the outside but on the inside we we tore up, you know what I mean? And and so, you know, it's just nice one-on-ones if you're leaders and you just want to have a, like a one-on-one -on -one thing, we can have a different conversation, you know what I mean? So um, anybody that's leading anything, you want to have that leadership to leadership chat, we can have that too. So I'm available. And you hear that if you are a leader okay. and you want to have that talk. leadership level conversation, he is available. And I think that, you know, it would be a lot to be learned. Uh, from Lewis Williams. So cool. thank you again. This has been wonderful. Um, and we're here, you know, if we ever can uh, offer anything to you. And um, I guess everybody, now you got to go back to work. That's the hardest part about getting off. <laughs> time, the time, no, time to go. Time <laughs> to go, to go work. back and really work. <laughs> thank you. Everybody. Thank you so much, hey, Lewis, thanks. for being with yeah, us. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Val. Um, thanks, everybody, for, you know, giving me your hour. I appreciate it. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. And, okay. um, Louis, I'm definitely going to be hitting you up because okay. I would love to continue this conversation. Um, okay. Just on a personal note, this really touched me because I really um, appreciate your candidness about um, what, we're, what we're facing every day, all the time. And so I think that that makes such a difference to be able to see a person at your level to be able to like describe how I'm feeling um, mm -hmm. at my job and the things mm -hmm. that I go through. So that meant a lot to me. So I definitely am okay. going to continue the conversation with you. And I just wanted to say a couple more things at the end, just to let everyone know about what's coming up for us. Again, thank you, Lewis and Candice for being with us mm -hmm. today. 
Um, we have chosen a random winner for um, a merchandise item that we're putting out. It's a mug that says make your own lane. It's really cool. And um, um, Stephanie Elton is our winner today. And I know that I saw her on here somewhere. Um, so she is our winner. And I will be emailing you, Stephanie, with information about how I can get that mug to you. Um, lastly, I just want to announce the next two events that we have coming up. Tomorrow, we had a great introduction to uh, <laughs> Mel and Sally's event. WTF, uh, everybody knows what that means, is TikTok, a virtual chat about the extremely popular app and its marketing potential. So Melanie Dunn, the owner of Cuttlefish Graphics and Sally Stearns, strategic partner with Hanson Incorporated, will be leading that discussion tomorrow at 9.30. Be sure to check that out. And then also on April 8th at 11.30 a.m., we're going to do our next episode of this series, Creative Direction featuring Pete Goldless and Yusuf Latif, who are two visual artists who just recently collaborated and finished two very large, very stunning murals at um, Toledo Hospital. And I had the pleasure of helping to facilitate that project. It is a beautiful piece. And they're gonna be talking about um, what it means to work together and the industry of public art. So if you know any students who are in that vein, um, any adults who are in that vein, any visual artists, this will be a great conversation for them. So be sure to check that out. All of our events can be found at aaftoledo.org forward slash upcoming hyphen events. That's all I have. Thank you all for joining us.